Okay, uh, hello everyone. I'm honored to be here today. Uh, for the next hour, I'm gonna be sharing a topic with you that I've been passionate about for several years. It's Django's database API and the custom database backends that use it. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Michael Manfrey. I joined the Django team last year, and for the past eight years, I've been maintaining Django MSSQL. As Mark stated, it's a custom database backend that allows Django to interact with Microsoft SQL Server. My introduction with Django started back in the spring of 2008. I was hired as a C-sharp desktop application developer for SRC. Uh, I had no, almost no experience with Python. I'd never heard of Django until I was actually in the interview for SRC. Uh, SRC was a standard Windows shop. Basically what this means is that all of the servers, the desktops, everything that they use is running Windows because that's what they're comfortable with. There was no Linux servers of any kind. Uh, Shortly after being hired, they had this project of redoing their website. It was a pretty extensive website interfacing with an existing database, had its standard businessy client server application, lots and lots of stuff to it. The other developer on the staff, uh, he, he was a fan of Django. He had been using it since before 1.0. He managed to convince them to use Django instead of VB.net or some other Microsoft technology, because those were pretty much where, the way that they wanted to usher things. Uh, there were a few caveats to, to the agreement. The website had to connect to the existing SQL Server database, so they couldn't use any form of replication or any backend thing to just move the data along from one database to a different one. Because they had done that in the past, there was lots of issues. And the other issue is Django had to run on Windows because they were Windows shops, they did not like Linux. <clears throat> At that time, uh, there was no suitable database backends for MS SQL. One or two existed, but they all had some issues that made them unusable at SRC. Out of this need, Django MSSQL was created. Most users of Django never really need to dig into the internals of Django. In 2008, Django was a lot less of an inclusive community than it is today. Windows and SQL Server were an extreme edge case. And my questions on IRC often were answered with, don't use Windows or use Postgres. Uh, to make things even more difficult, the database backend API is a private API. So if you ever hear it's private, it's internal with regards to Django, that means it's not supported, and to help make it sure it's not supported, like externally, they don't document it. This pretty much forced me to venture down deep into the code. I felt lost, confused, it was very frustrating. Despite the pain of this experience, I feel like I came away with a much better understanding and appreciation uh, than what mo most others get to just take for granted. For this talk, I've made a few assumptions. On this side is a query found in Django's test suite. Hopefully it makes sense to all of you. It's okay if you don't understand why it's adding the CEO's salary to the number of employees. I don't understand it e either. <laughs> and this could be something that one of you could fix during the sprints. There's lots of little things like this in the test suite. Uh, the test is still valid for what it's trying to do, but it's a little weird. <laughs> I also created this talk with the assumption that you've all written raw SQL at some point. Uh, the SQL on this slide is generated by the query above it when using SQLite. If none of this slide makes sense to you, no worries. You should still be able to follow along with most of this talk. For those of you who have not seen James Bennett's tutorial, Django in Depth, I hi highly recommend it. The tutorial is based upon Django 1.8, and while some of the things have changed in Django, it's still worth watching a few times. In the first portion of his presentation, he gives a great overview of various portions of Django's ORM, how they work together, and he starts with the database backends, which is the lowest level, and then works up one level at a time. This talk is a more focused look at the bottom two most layers, the database backend API and the SQL compiler. I will also talk a little bit about expressions in the query class, but mostly in relation to how these are used and modified by a database backend. While guiding you through the depths of Django, I will share with you some of the common and interesting problems that backends have needed to solve. You will also get to learn about a few of the database quirks. In talks about the low levels of Django, especially the ORM, it's often said that there are dragons. It's true, the code is kind of scary. It's okay though. They're quite friendly once you get to know them. So what does a database backend actually do? The simple answer, it's a bit of code that sits between the Django's ORM objects and the drivers for the database. It's kind of the glue that binds the two together. The database drivers typically consist of Python package that implements a PEP249 database adapter that wraps the lower level system drivers. 
The system drivers uh, could even be something like the requests package. For example, if you wanted to write a backend that worked against a REST API instead of a true, just actual database. Uh, Django MSSQL relies upon the ADO DBA, DB API adapter that wraps Microsoft DLLs of some various flavor. There's a few of them. And for those that are fam more familiar with Postgres, the adapter is PsychoPG2, which usually wraps libq at the system level. So Python it's PEP 249, this defines a standard for database adapters. This makes it so frameworks like Django have an easier time supporting all the different database backends that, out there, so they don't have to redo it for themselves, and there can be a lot more sharing. So it defines common interface for connections, cursors, exceptions. It even provides several different ways of putting placeholder values into SQL strings. <clears throat> Django uses the format param style, but there are a few other database backends that rely upon QMark. This will be referenced a little bit later. Django makes it very easy to interact with the database in a somewhat consistent way. This prevents users from needing to fully understand all the capabilities and limitations of the underlying database. This is good, but not all databases are created equal, and it's helpful to learn some of their differences. SQL is a standard with many reversions. Database servers like to extend the standard, and not all of them do it in the same way. From my experience, supporting slicing has been the most troublesome. Uh, some other oddities relate to transactions, different data types, and their precisions. Also, what exactly is null? Sometimes null equals null, sometimes not. Other times, null equals an empty string. Also, how would you actually order null? These are the types of things that database backends need to understand for, uh, on behalf of Django. Database backend is kind of like the power grid or some other critical infrastructure. When it works, great, everyone is happy, and the users forget that it's even there. The only direct interaction that most users have when they're, is when they're setting up their project. They'll install the necessary Python packages, and then they'll add its path, uh, the database is setting under engine. When a backend is loaded, the connection handler class imports a module named base under the path defined by engine. This imposes the first bit of packet structure for database backends, and it's how Django finds the database API classes that it implements. While researching for this talk, I discovered many instances of custom database backends that were all shapes and sizes. On this slide is the entire code from the backend Django Postgres read-only. It extends, uh, it's essentially a one-line code extension for Django's built-in PsychoPG2 backend. All it does is it just changes the connection string to read-only. So it's creating a database backend can be very trivial. I can't imagine this took the developer more than a few minutes. <clears throat> Another example that's less trivial is Django SQL, SQL Server. The, uh, the database backend is slightly more involved. It actually extends Django MSSQL, which is the one that I maintain. Uh, and basically what it does, it just it shims out the under-level under uh, drivers from instead of using ADO's drivers, uh, it uses Python TDS because they wanted to be able to run this from Linux instead of just being forced to run it on Windows. Uh, he also managed to implement a couple of updates beyond what I've done, for example, select for update, uh, and just a few other patches that I haven't just gotten around to implementing for myself. So a database backend that extends another backend doesn't necessarily need to handle all the little quirks of the database. It gets to focus on just the specific things that it cares about. When writing a database backend from scratch, these are all the classes that need to be implemented. Django provides base implementations for each class. These base classes are essentially the, the backend API. These base classes are found under django.db.backends.base. The list is ordered with the top being the classes that must be overridden and tweaked first, and the bottom requires less changes or have less impact for most projects that would use the backend. For example, in Django MSQL, I haven't implemented anything for database validation, and I didn't even do database client either. Uh, the database wrapper class must be importable from the backend's base module. The rest of the classes are accessed from the database wrapper instance. The database wrapper class is named perfectly for what it does. It wraps the underlying database and is the main code path for Django to access all the backend's functionality. <clears throat> In this class is the code for interpreting Django's database's settings, maintaining usable connections to the database, creating cursors that are used to run queries, turning database constraints on and off, and it's also responsible for handling transactions. One of the most trivial and important things a database backend, in a database backend is the vendor string. This is a string that helps identify the database type. 
a lot of things in Django's ORM key off of the vendor string to do some bit of behavior for a type of database without needing to know about every specific database backend that has been implemented in the entire community. All database backends that work against uh, Microsoft SQL Server will typically use Microsoft. The Postgres ones will use PostgreSQL, for example. There are two documented uses of the vendor string. The first is to allow overriding an expressions as SQL method. I'll cover this later in the talk. The other is the required DB vendor model meta option. I first discovered this when, while searching through the code for, for this talk, and then discovered that it was actually publicly documented. Uh, this, option, <laughs> this option is used by migrations in a multi-DB configuration. Uh, basically what it does is it restricts the model's migrations to a specific database type. So if you had a, a model that has uh, Postgres-specific fields on it, you don't want to try running migrations against SQL Server if you have multiple. Uh, there's three attributes on the database wrapper class that define the basic C uh, SQL syntax. Those are the model lookups, operators, and pattern strings. Operators defines the simple lookup operations and pattern lookup operations when dealing with raw strings. This uses Python's percent style string formatting to generate the SQL. <clears throat> pattern escape is used to sanitize the string. This usually means escaping the SQL wildcard characters. For MS SQL, the database backend spares users from having to put triple nested replace calls in their queries. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, pattern ops defines the pattern lookup SQL clauses when the right hand side is an expression or something that is not a raw string. The percent character is a wildcard uh, for the like operator, so pattern ops and pattern escape use string dot format instead of percent style formatting just to make it a little bit easier to read. The last important group of attributes on the database wrapper class that I'm going to talk about uh, define how a model's fields are mapped to the database's columns. Data types and data type suffix are used to construct the SQL for the data type. They will be combined to convert the appropriate SQL, so it's possible to find the data type plus the suffix in data types or split them apart, kind of like what I did for auto field and big auto field. One does one way, one does the other. Uh, data type check constraints defines the SQL database check constraint for a field. When these strings go through string formatting, all of the double underscore dict values for the field are provided to it. If a value needs to be quoted, for example, the column name, the named format string value can be prefixed with a QN underscore, and Django pretty much takes care of that magic for you. <clears throat> and there's a few uh, methods that a backend needs to Im implement on its own. Uh, a database wrapper needs to implement it on its own. It's for the connections and cursors, the transaction management, and for foreign keys constraints. Uh, the foreign key constraints in the base implementation are no ops, so you don't actually have to do anything with those, whereas the ones for connections, cursors, and transaction management, those all raise not implemented exceptions, so you have to do something for those, even if it's just pass. <clears throat> Much like database wrapper wraps the database's connection, the cursor wrapper class wraps the database's cursor. Django provides a default implementation in Django DB backends utils. This wraps all the underlying Python cursors methods to catch and rethrow database exceptions uh, using an exception that Django better understands. In that Python module are helper functions that are capable of converting Python types to and from database strings. For example, decimals and various date and time types. There's a few reasons why a database backend may need to implement its own cursor wrapper. Uh, for example, it might need to remap a database exceptions to something more appropriate. MySQL and Oracle need to do this in the built-in database backends. Uh, it might need to actually change the, the param style from uh, format to QMark. This is something that SQL, SQLite and PyODBC need to do. Uh, <clears throat> And the cursor is actually instantiated from database wrappers makes underscore cursor method, which is used when you do a connection dot cursor, it makes its way down to this, which actually constructs it. The database wrapper does all the work of cursor wrapper, uh, sorry, the debug wrapper does all the work of cursor wrapper and adds timing metri metrics and logs all the queries that it sees. These are, there are two ways of getting Django to use a debug cursor for whatever queries your code is doing. You can either set force debug cursor to true or settings.debug. Debug cursors are a great way of figuring out what a Django query looks like in SQL. Uh, 
Much like em Emmerich, I use them often when I want to be certain I wrote the correct Django query. <laughs> the database features class is where a backend gets to identify all the different sorts of features and behaviors it supports. For example, can it slice subqueries? Does it have various native data types? Or will Django need to convert to and from another type, usually a string? It is possible to poke the database to see what it can do. Django does issue certain queries against the database automatic to automatically determine if it supports transactions and supports certain expressions. Many of the features are only used by the test suite to figure out which test it should skip or what assertions to make. When maintaining a backend, this use of features helps you follow a, a test-driven development style. The tests are already written and skipped until you're ready to try and implement or implement, emulate the feature yourself. When Django does a migration, it needs to generate a bunch of SQL statements to change the database's schema to match the new model definitions. Not all databases can do this the same way. The database schema editor class is part of the backend that knows how to do those changes for its database. For more details about migrations, see Andrew's talk from two years ago at Duth. The schema editor class provides many SQL template strings. These are modified by the database backend and define the expected syntax for the database when creating, destroying, or altering any schema object that Django understands. For example, tables, columns, indices, constraints, etc. For most DDL statements, the SQL templates provide enough flexibility to get things working. <clears throat> if the underlying database is different enough from what Django expects, things get a lot more complicated really quickly, and changes are required to the methods in this class. SQL Server and Oracle are databases that cannot rely solely upon the SQL templates and run into problems when doing field alterations. There's two approaches to overriding the base alter field implementation, which is where all this happens in that class. Uh, the built-in Oracle backend has taken the approach of, let's try to let the base uh, schema editor handle all of it, and then if it, it'll try to catch specific database errors and apply a workaround. And that workaround is basically create a new column, copy all the data from the ex existing column over, and then delete the, the old column, and then rename the new one back into place. This works. The big negative is that if the table is large, this could take a really long time. For SQL Server, I had to implement it differently because the, the time for the migration was too long for our database size. So I re-implemented re the underscore alter field method with the various fixes required for the database. It fixes the issues without needing to do the fallback of the large data copy. Uh, the real negative to this, though, is that it takes a significant amount of maintenance effort after each Django release. Once again, this is a private API and not subject to the same backwards compatibility rules as the rest of Django. Even though it seems like there's no new ORM features with a release, code can and will be refactored at the lower levels. If possible, it's best to try to avoid overriding any of the methods of the database schema editor, except for quote value and prepare default. These two have to be implemented. Quote value returns a quoted version of a literal value so that it's safe to use in an SQL string. Some database adapters provide a method to do this for you, but others do not. For Oracle and SQL Server, they have implementations that look something like this. <clears throat> and prepare default typically just calls quote value. The big red comment up there saying it's not safe as a warning, uh, don't ever use this from user code or anything that's provided from, with data from the user. Uh, because you will be, we put no guards for SQL injections in there. The code is safe to use with migrations because value that's passed in is only ever provided by developers that create the migrations. Database creation is responsible for creating, destroying, and cloning test databases. It's used by test server management command and the test runner. This class had a much larger role in the olden days when SyncDB was still being used. Each of the create, clone, and destroy operations has two methods. The method without the underscore is called by Django. Those provide the database agnostic behaviors, such as the keepDB flag, managing database, database names when paralyzing the tests. The underscore prefix methods are the intended hook for database backends, and those are what needs to do all the backend specific stuff. OK, by a show of hands, who has started a Django project by using InspectDB to define your models? That is actually more than I thought it would be. So for projects using SQL Server and Oracle, this is a lot more common. The introspection class is 
pretty much what knows how to look into the database and figure out all the various schema objects that it contains. InspectDB uses the queries in the reverse data type mapping to generate the model code. These models are not perfect and are not meant to be a starting point to save, they're only meant to be a starting point to save you a bit of typing. Despite its documented imperfections and the relatively low usage, introspection has been one of the main reasons people have opened tickets against Django MSSQL over the years. InspectDB is it's kind of like a stepping stone that gets companies into using Django. It's like, hey, I get to save a lot of typing, so let me just go with this. <laughs> The database client class is used by the DB shell management command. Uh, it does slightly more than sa saving you from typing out PSQL and then like the connection parameters or SQL command for in the Microsoft world. I don't use it, never implemented it for Django MSSQL because SQL Management Studio is an amazing tool. I really wish there was something like that for like Postgres and the other database backends. <laughs> database validation is new with Django 1.10. It hooks the database backend into the checks framework. The backend can do checks for individual fields or the database as a whole. Currently, MySQL is the only database backend that's using this. Uh, the base class is the smallest of the backend classes. All of the code for the class is up on this slide. By default, it does no checks for anything, which is great because it's brand new and I didn't really notice that it existed until I went digging into the code. Uh, the check method is called by the check database backends register check, and it does this for each of the configured databases. This method is where the database level checks should go. For example, MySQL uses this to warn you if your database has, doesn't have strict mode set because you know, truncating data silently is not really a good thing. Uh, the check field method has a much longer call path. It basically works its way down from the model into the fields and then finally ends up in this uh, check field method. <clears throat> okay, the database operations class uh, encapsulates all sorts of backend specific differences for the databases. It's basically like a dumping ground for things that didn't have a better fit in any of the, any of the other API classes. This class spe uh, specifies where to find the SQL compiler used by the backend. Postgres is unofficially officially the favored database of Django. Uh, it's its operations class points to the built-in SQL compilers, so that's, by default, Django wants an SQL that kind of looks like what Postgres wants. Uh, most database backends have to actually implement their own SQL compilers and uh, put the path in here. For Django MSSQL, most of my time working on this class was devoted to dates and times. Some of the methods help to make sure Django has the correct SQL as the query worked its way down into the database, Database converters make sure Django was given the appropriate Python object on the way back out. Fun fact, MS SQL has date time, date time two, and a few other data types specifically for dates and times. And trying to figure out how and when things should be casted back and forth between the different versions is not, is not trivial. OK, the, the next section of my talk deals with portions of Django's ORM that are basically one level up above the backend API. This level includes the SQL compiler, expressions, and the query class. All of them have a method called asSQL that's used to render the SQL string. <clears throat> the query class is somewhat of a complex beast. It contains multiple lists of objects that together represent the database operation. For the sake of this talk, all you really need to know is that it represents the database operation. It has an asSQL method that generates the SQL, and an SQL compiler is constructed for each query. There are five SQL compilers, each meant to handle a different type of SQL statement. Django provides each of these compilers, and they implement most of the necessary logic for turning a query into an SQL string with a list of parameters. <clears throat> the string and parameters are important because of SQL injection. You want to keep those separate so that it can substitute them in later with uh, placeholders. More on that later, though. There's a query class for each of the different type of SQL compiler. If you want to know what they are, you can look in django.db.models.sql.subqueries to find them. Most customizations done by a database backend will happen in the SQL compiler class. If no changes are needed for the others, the backend will still need to provide its own subclasses that inherit from the SQL compiler class that it created. <clears throat> On this slide are some of the reasons why a database backend might need a custom SQL compiler. 
For MSSQL, these bullet points are all of the big SQL tweaks that I've had to do over the years, with the biggest one being limit offset. So the dragon is sad because some databases think paging a query's results should be difficult. I don't know why. Limit offset has been around for many, many years, but some don't believe in that. Uh, so here's two ways that you can limit uh, a query set. You have one where you just provide a limit, so it's like, give me everything from the beginning up until this point, and then you have one where it's like, okay, I have a starting point, and then just give me until my limit from there. For Postgres and MySQL, the yellow text is basically the SQL for making this happen. It's very simple, you have your query, there's a little bit of text that gets appended to the, at the end, pretty straightforward, everyone should be able to understand this, even if you've never seen SQL before in your life. For SQL Server 2008, and the bottom also Oracle has that, it's a little bit more complex. Um, as you can see, for even when you just say like, okay, just give me like the first five, you actually have to rip apart the SQL string, find a specific spot to put in like, okay, I want the top five. And then for when you actually want to say, I want the top five, but I don't want the first one, uh, you kind of have to do a whole lot of SQL man mangling and ma uh, magic. So the white text is the stuff that is provided to me by the base compiler. All the yellow stuff, uh, that's what I have to do. <laughs> and buried in there is a whole lot of field aliasing and adding additional columns for like the row number so I can do the where clause on that, and then stripping out all that extra stuff so that Django doesn't get confused by what I've done. <laughs> uh, things got a lot better with SQL Server 2012. Uh, basically, they added support for the SQL 2008 ISO standard, which finally added a limit offset syntax, which they went with offset fetch. I don't know why, but they did. But as you can see, it's, it's somewhat similar to the limit offset. Uh, if nothing else, it's just some SQL that gets appended to the query, which makes it much easier to actually support and maintain. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, once I was able to drop support for SQL 2008, I ripped out probably about three to 400 lines of code that was just Disgusting. <laughs> My SQL compiler stopped feeling like a house of cards built on a trampoline. I just never wanted to look at that code. And every time I did, I'm like, okay, somebody opened an issue. Well, it only affects this one specific way, and there's, they have a workaround. Here, just do this query instead. It'll be fine. <laughs> okay, expressions are a tree-like structure that knows how to turn itself into SQL statements by using an as-sql method. All exp Expressions inherit from a base expression, which is uh, combinable. The combinable class provides the ability to combine two objects with a connector. And that connector can be some arithmetic operation or bitwise operator, for example. Expressions are publicly documented and provide users with a lot of low-level control over SQL and queries. Previously, this was pretty much the exclusive realm for the database backend. When expressions landed, there was a significant am amount of work needed in Django MS SQL to get things working again. The effort was totally worth it. Many of the things that were previously needed, like some really wiry, wiry code and backend magic, like they became trivial with expressions. The SQL uh, generation was contained in these nice little modular pieces that provided me a lot better access to the other parts of the query and things that I needed. So thank you, Josh. <laughs> Uh, so this is the built-in length expression. It's a transform, which basically means that it's a function that will modify a field, and it's usable in a query by its lookup name. Uh, this is one of the expressions that is slightly different on SQL Server. So at the top, as you can see, it's like this is the, the substitution that I have to do in Django MSSQL. Instead of length, it just has len. And the override is monkey patch it in, and then just provide the new function name. Uh, there's other functions or, that are not exactly just as simple to fix. For example, substring, uh, by default on Postgres, you have the SQL expression that you want to do the substring on, which can become a string eventually. And then you have the offset you want, and then an optional third parameter, which is uh, how long you want it. If you don't specify the, the length of it, it'll just give you until the end of the string. Microsoft kind of felt that all three of those were really important. So you have to specify a length, and to do that, uh, I basically have to modify the, the tree of the expression to include this new magical value that is just a really large number, because uh, SQL Server will just say, 
hey, this is beyond the end of the string, I'll just stop at the end. <clears throat> and sometimes you can't actually uh, even do any similar thing on the database backend because it just it doesn't have the same function implemented. For example, SQL Server does not have a greatest function. Uh, so what it has to do is it uses a template-based expression to provide a essentially a subquery to uh, do the same behaviors uh, because max is an aggregate and it takes the maximum value out of several rows and greatest is not an aggregate, and it takes the maximum value out of a single row. So this is the way you kind of merge the two behaviors together for a SQL Server. And you may have noticed that uh, the as Microsoft decorator in the previous code snippets, the documented way of setting the as vendor method is to monkey patch it onto the expression. How to register these overrides was discussed, and monkey patching was agreed to be the most appropriate. For Django MSSQL, the vendor method is named as Microsoft because Microsoft is the vendor string. I really hope everyone has heard of SQL injections. Uh, for those who have not, this XKCD comic explains it really well. Long story short, you can't trust any data from a user to be, if you want to be safe. SQL is strings, and most projects need to store strings. Special care is needed to make sure user-provided strings are not executed. When using query sets, Django and the database backend will protect you from SQL injections. All tables and column names are quoted. Values are not directly added to the generate, generated SQL strings. Uh, they're provided to the underlying database cursor as a separate list of parameters that are safely escaped by the database driver. If you use raw or custom SQL with a database cursor, you, you're on your own to make sure you avoid all the SQL injection attacks. By design, database backends work with a lot of SQL and need to be certain that anything that we add into the SQL, it constructs it safe. So for recap, the top bit, don't ever do that in your code, please. <laughs> okay, there's been a lot of information so far and we're almost to the Q&A. When you create and maintain a database backend, testing is the most important piece. While maintaining Django MS SQL, I discovered early on that without good test coverage, it was not possible to have any confidence that some feature or query would work properly with each deploy. There's a lot of things that can subtly change, causing the backend to break. When the backend breaks, it doesn't always raise an exception. Sometimes the queries work just enough to make it seem like nothing's broken, but the results are wrong. This is much worse than a noisy exception because it can lead to data corruption. <laughs> new versions of Django and new versions of the database server are the least likely to catch you or your users of your database backend off guard. Most companies are not likely to upgrade to the latest and greatest version immediately after it's been released. Many Windows companies still follow the adage, wait until the service pack. All databases should explicitly list the major versions of Django and the versions of the database it officially supports. Not all users will read the readme file, which can lead to extra support tickets. Uh, to help minimize those, I encourage you, if you're going to do a database backend, to put these checks in there just to catch those cases, because people will ask, hey, why doesn't this work? And it's usually some really disgusting, obscure traceback that has nothing related to any of their code. It's usually deep in the internals of the ORM. <clears throat> the best way to test a database backend is against Django's test suite. It has test coverage for all the features Django supports, these tests are usually written by someone other than yourself, which is great. Uh, and they're also merged whenever that new functionality or bug was actually added into Django. Another benefit is that it means that I can subconsciously write a test and it won't, or I can't subconsciously write a test and have it match the implementation that I just did. To run the test suite against a custom database backend, all you need to do is create a settings file. Make sure it's in the Python path and then pass it to the run test PUI file. Around the time of Django 1.4, I set the goal of making Django MSSQL pass the entire Django test suite. I soon realized that I needed a few asterisks for that goal. I realized that I needed to keep local branches with changes to this test suite specific for Django MSSQL. Uh, some of these changes were waiting for uh, the pull request that I submitted to merge into Django. Others were shortcuts or assumptions to improve performance specifically for SQL Server. Uh, SQL Server has this now known bug where it does some really uh, expensive things when you disable and re-enable constraints, which is something that happens when you load fixtures. Uh, 
to the point where uh, at one point it would take me eight hours to do a full run of the test suite because all this time was just building and tearing down and validating the information, which was essentially a no-op. <clears throat> but Microsoft is aware of it now and they, they're working on a fix and uh, the friendly core devs have found a solution to minimize the impact of that. So life got much better and now only takes about a half hour. <laughs> uh, the, some of the tests also have some hard-coded SQL in them, which just was not compatible with uh, uh, MSSQL. And some of them also had assertion values that were different than what Django MSSQL expected. <clears throat> By design, some tests, they would just never pass with Django MSSQL. And they weren't really worth the effort of keeping a local commit and updating that with all the new versions of Django that came out. For Django MSSQL, I extended database creation to monkey patch uh, these known failing tests and basically flagged them as expected failures for specific versions of Django. Uh, a few of these tests were due to a quirk in SQL Server's datetime data type. Its precision is roughly three milliseconds. So it would round times to .000, .003, and .007. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was a fun thing to, to learn. Uh, many of Django's tests had hard-coded test values with a precision that didn't perfectly line up with these for some weird reason. Uh, so I discovered those, yay. Uh, other tests, they would fail because I would either get too many results or not enough results back because <clears throat> the, the, the value stored would basically get moved to one side or the other of the filter when it did this rounding cutoff. So despite the awesomeness that it's Django's test suite, a database backend is still going to pretty much have to maintain its own test suite to cover all these little quirky behaviors to make sure things are doing what they should be doing. <laughs> Not all databases are created equally, so you can't test them the same way. For every database backend, there are certain tests that should not be run. In the Django test suite, there are two main ways of conditionally running tests for a database backend. The first is by checking for the vendor string. This should only be done when absolutely necessary. Because when you use the vendor string, it prevents other database backends from benefiting from the code coverage. So if the vendor string is not something like, okay, this is a quirk specific for like MySQL and it impacts no other database whatsoever, uh, it's best to, it's like that's the time when you want to use vendor string. Any other time you kind of want to have a, a, a feature because uh, back in the d days of Django 1.4, uh, the use of the vendor string was very pro uh, prolific in the test suite. There were several tests that I've had a fix on my local branches. Uh, many of these changes were re related to like field introspection because it just said, okay, it, this is Postgres, Postgres is expecting this data type, MySQL expects this one, when in reality, uh, other database backends would be able to leverage that same test anyway. <clears throat> so to, to make it easier for doing database feature level checks, uh, Django provides three decorators that Anna discussed in her talk yesterday. Uh, all of them are importable from Django.test. So what many people want to know about database backends are the non-relational backends, like Django non-rel. Uh, the one question asked is like, are they really even database backends? Because they replace not only uh, the connection portion to the database, they actually have to modify large portions of the ORM as well. And they kind of provide their own database API for the specific non-rel or no SQL databases. So the ORM's main job is to turn some relational query into SQL. Non-rel databases are not relational and don't use SQL. So I mean, they don't really kind of line up. Uh, and because they have to replace large portions of the ORM, it's basically, long story short, it's complicated and a lot of work. If you want to do it, have fun. Um, I can't really help you. <laughs> uh, so like me, most people only start working on database backends because they don't have a choice. <laughs> uh, the code is big and scary at first, but my hope is that uh, I've made it a little bit more approachable, and I encourage you all to dig into the code from time to time. It doesn't take long to feel comfortable. You might even make a backend maintainer like me very happy by sending a pull request or two, please. And Thank you. That's all I have for my talk today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Um, 
So the database backend is internal-ish. Is there any sort of documentation <coughs> other than the video of this talk for someone who's trying to do something like that? Uh, fortunately, nowadays the, the code itself is actually very well documented for the database backends. Like all the methods that you have to imp implement, all the attributes, they, they very well define what it is that they expect to happen, and in some cases even why that it exists the way it does. So I mean, that, that, was a good, that became a good starting point later down the line for new versions of Django, for like Django 1.8, 1.9. So when like migrations landed and then expressions, the documentation in there was basically what I had to go off of. Plus by that point, the community, like the core devs were like much more, uh, I guess I just beat them down in the fact that I'm not going away. So they just like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll actually answer his questions. He's, he's asking the right things. He's, he's not just like, oh, I, I kind of want to do this weird thing. Uh, so it just helps if you have intelligent questions and persistence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the code is actually quite readable, <clears throat> although there's not formal documentation yes. of everything in the, doc, yeah. in the Django docs. The code is reasonably well. Yeah, I mean, there, there has been discussions in the core team about should we actually document it while still trying to keep it as a private API, and then there's, it kind of, it's still up in the air, so which, whether or not that should happen. There are issues with private documentation. <clears throat> that if we, at the moment, the deal is if we document something, we can't <clears throat> backwards and incompatibly change it, which is good for backend database maintainers. But for things like expressions would not have happened if they had to maintain the same backwards compatibility. It would have been impossible to do them. Um, are there <coughs> any plans to add the MS SQL backend to core? Uh, so adding it to the GitHub Django Django will not happen for MS SQL. I'm st actually strongly opposed to that. I actually, I'm a firm believer that a lot of the database backends should actually get moved out of core. Uh, and then become kind of like, there should be some that are like just officially blessed by the Django team itself. They will support them, they will test them, uh, but whether or not SQL Server becomes that, it would be nice. It's not, nece it's not really necessary as long it's, as it's actively maintained. So there's a potential <coughs> to become something like channels where it's not <coughs> built into Django itself but yes. it's an official project. Yes. And fortunately, Microsoft has actually become a lot more involved with open source and they've been putting a lot of effort towards trying to be better citizens in the open source community. So uh, last winter, they flew myself and a couple other database backend people and Tim out there to basically have like a, a couple hack days and put us in front of their engineers so like, hey, how can we make your lives easier? Uh, so I mean, they're contributing to some extent uh, engineering support to make the drivers better on all the different OSs. They're also uh, potentially going to contribute money to make sure that these backends are maintained uh, in a more active fashion. So. so, if you have an interest in maintaining these sort of things, come and talk to us. There are potential ways to improve it. Um, <coughs> as I mentioned at the start of the talk, we all, or quite a number of the core team, are very fond of Postgres. Um, in your opinion, what does MS SQL do? Better. Why would if one had to choose from any database, what are the reasons why you would go for MS SQL? Uh, so some of the nicest things about SQL Server are the tooling around it. So SQL Management Studio, I can't praise that enough. They did an amazing job on making an easy to use uh, interface for accessing and running SQL and just kind of seeing what's going on on the server. Uh, with regards to the database itself, some of the things are a little quirky, but it's it's pretty good, and it has a lot of the, the functionality that you'd expect, and things just kind of work. I mean, it has the quirks that make it run a little bit slower in certain instances, especially when you're tearing down a database and trying to build it back up. But for the most part, it's just as performant. It does good selection for which indices it's going to use. And there's a really wide community over uh, just supporting it, because there's thousands and thousands of companies that are using this, and there's any question that you'd ever have about the SQL that you'd use for it has already been, if not on Microsoft's uh, knowledge base, is on Stack Overflow or some other resource. And things like the, the Django <coughs> and the SQL backend and the, the Oracle backend that's still in core at the moment, the existence of those allows people who are stuck in a more 
corporate kind of <clears throat> IT system to start using Django yes. without having to <clears throat> rip it out and go. Yes, yeah, so I mean, like basically, as I, I said before, uh, when I was hired by Semiconductor Research Corporation, they didn't really have any incentive or desire to branch out from, we have Windows servers, we know how to administrate them, we are, we're good, we're going to stick with that. So, I mean, if, if it wasn't for the ability of Django to have this back-end API that could actually communicate with SQL Server, I probably would not be on this stage today. I, I don't know if I would have actually got into the Django community at all. So... And so there's a couple of questions around kind of expressions and the syntax. Yeah, there's, you now, when you're writing your back end, you now have some things that live in the back end and some things that are your own expressions and some things that monkey patch into existing expressions and the, the SQL's quite distributed. Um, do you think there's a plan to kind of move in a particular direction or how do you feel about that? Uh, I mean, I kind of like it the way it is because you, you have these little things that give end users a lot of control. Uh, in the past, when, when these side types of like aggregates or whatever need to be implemented by somebody, I would get a ticket open like, hey, you, don't, you never actually implemented this. Can you add it to the SQL compiler? And that never really came as like a pull request. It always came as a, hey, I want this. Can you do it? And a lot of the times, because I was working on this database backend because I had to, uh, if it wasn't something that my employer needed, it basically went to the, like, the very bottom of the list of things that I can do. That was the, the extra... like eight to 12 hours a day I would do beyond my job on just maintaining this. There's, a, there's an extra problem you run into when you've got a, an expression. It's what I call a ninth party problem. You've got a third party back database back end and a third party expression and you want to make the two of them talk to each other. Um, at the moment, we deal with this through the monkey patching, through the monkey patching yeah. approach, so that me and my user code can monkey patch that thing to know how to talk to that database with Django over here somewhere. Um, how do you think we would be able to use the single dispatch function from Python 3 to solve a similar problem? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, potentially, I'd have to dig into it and think about it a little bit more. Can't really answer on the spot with that one. <laughs> cool. Um, and a final question. Where did that crazy row number syntax come from? Um, I... I don't know. It's, I don't know who invented that or why they decided to use that. Because Oracle does it. I mean, well, Oracle I... does it too, so it must have been in one of the earlier SQL standards, possibly SQL 92. Um, but the whole concept of like, hey, like paging through a list of results, that's something that pretty much every application, either in the business world or on websites, will need to do at some point in time. So I can't imagine why they had it so difficult or why they... I guess, at least in the Microsoft world, uh, a lot of the things tend to use stored procedures where you can make use of server-side cursors a lot more, so they, they didn't run into the problem as much. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs>